the bottom line is that there are so many problems and only one answer. And I've heard people say, well, Jesus is the answer. What's he the answer to? Last week we talked about out of the book of Psalm 107, and not to go back and revisit that whole thing because I got a third through my message last week. But, but to think about what he does is to understand that he is a voice of good news. And when you walk through this psalm, Psalm 107, you see over and over that there was a problem that people were in poverty, that they struggled, that they didn't have enough to eat and things. And, they, and the Bible says then they cried. And this, this to me is such a, a pride breaker for men and uh, ladies. I think you may understand it a little more because you're more emotional. God made you that way for a reason. Uh, but for us to cry out, and when we cry out to the Lord, the Scripture says that when they did that, that, they, that hunger and thirst, that let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds to men. Then there was another problem that they had, and, and that problem was prison. They were inbound, and, and, and they needed help and the, during that time of prison. And you don't have to be behind bars to be in prison. Addiction can own you. Uh, unforgiveness can own you. Amen. And when you cry out during that time, the Bible says when they cried out, he heard them, and he delivered them. And then there was the plague. And we talked tenderly about the plague because the, the bottom line is this. We know a lot of people that are struggling with um, uh, Again, we go back toward addictions, but when, when it talks about the plague, it said they abhorred meat. They couldn't eat. They were thin, skeletal. Amen. Their bodies were breaking down. Probably had to do a lot with uh, uh, sexual diseases or something of that nature. And they cried unto the Lord, and he heard them. Again, that compassion. Compassion is love in action. We talked about the pilgrims, that maybe your life has nothing to do with plague or, or prison or poverty. You're just a pilgrim. You're just traveling. That's me. I went from Alabama to San Antonio to Houston. You know, I'm just traveling through the world. But the bottom line is this. Even with that, things happen to you. You know, within one week, I had wrecked my wife's vehicle. She wrecked her daddy's vehicle. And then at a, a home that we own, a tree fell on my daughter's car and destroyed the windshield and stuff. And it only happened in three days. You know, and, they don't, and then once you take down the tree and pay the deductibles, you're out of $5,000 just like that. And you think, man, that money sure left quick. It's just life. Everybody say life. Life happens. Amen. It, and, and sometimes you'll go months and things are good, and then bang, 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 it, it just happens. And, and this is what the Scripture talked about in one, Psalm 107. But it was the same answer. It was the same answer. They cried unto the Lord, and he heard them in their distress and delivered them out of it. Same answer. Different problems. There's always a problem. Amen. But it's the same answer. That's why I say Jesus is such a wonderful, he is the answer. He's the only answer I know. So when I think about it, first, it's the voice of good news. When you hear a voice, certain voices bless you. Amen. To hear that voice, to, to uh, look, when I come home and my dogs hear my voice, there was a day I said, my dog, until a friend of mine who's watching right now, fed a stray dog on my front porch, and that became my new dog, Foxy. Amen. And when she hears my voice, she gets all excited. There's something about your voice. Your voice just it, it gets the dogs worked up. A, a strange voice make my dogs mad. Oh, Coda get upset. But when he hears daddy's voice, he heard the alpha, and it, that's good stuff. So, amen. There's something about a voice of good news. But the second thing I want to talk to you about is the validity of our message. The validity of our message. And the third point I'm going to finish on today is the value of humanity. I want to tell you why that he is the answer. First off, because he created us and we have value. Everybody here has value. The other, and, when, and this is our problem. We quit treating people with value. That's why abortion is so abominable because it says, again, that the, child, the only thing that matters is the mother's rights. And we got this right thing. We got this free thing. What, can you name anything that's free? Even your salvation costs Jesus. But we got this free thing going that we think free. We ought to get free, free, free. You, there is nothing free. Amen. The air you breathe still came through the sacrifice of Christ. Amen. Everything God had planned had, had something attached to it. So the, uh, the freedom I got came at a price. And so, every, so, it, so it's just to try to convince a generation that you have nothing free that somebody's got to pay for it. 
Amen. Somebody got to do that for you. So, and, and please, quit uh, acknowledging the government like they're God. Because they're they not. Amen. You, you, you do understand all we've done is elect officials to take care of our money. You, let me say something that sounds cruel. We'd have done divorced anything like that if they took care of our money that way. Amen. They're not doing a great job with it. <laughs> Hallelujah. They just think it's theirs to use and give themselves raises and whatever. So let's get back to the gospel. Get off your little horse there, Jerry. All right. I'm all right. Here we go. <laughs> let me just tell you about the gospel. The gospel is simple. Everybody say simple. It's so simple. The gospel is God's creation. It's, what it is. it's not evolution. God created us. Amen. He set things in motion. Second is Satan's deception. Amen. He came in. He deceived Adam and Eve in the beginning. And he's been deceiving ever since. It's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's not changed. He's always trying to deceive. He's had 5,000 years of known history to deceive mankind. That's what he does. Amen. That, that's his thing. Third thing is, is Christ's substitution. We should have died. He substituted for us. Amen. Some of you have been substitute teachers. How many found that to be difficult? Amen. To substitute, to step in somebody else's place. That, that's a hard thing. To, to, and that's what he did for us. He substituted for us. Amen. And then he brought about our restoration. This is how simple the gospel is. God's creation, Satan's deception, Christ's substitution, and our restoration. This is the message the world needs to hear. Amen. At the world, listen, guys, we, we can't do this on our own. We need a substitute. We need what Jesus did. So it brings us to what I call the validity of our message. The word validity means the quality of being well-grounded, sound, or correct. As believers, as Christians, one of the things that we need to be is more well-grounded, sound, or correct. We need to be able to give an answer. You know, I have people say, Pastor, tell them what you think. I want you to tell them what you think. Amen. It's time for us to grow up and to understand that. Well, what do people really believe about the birth of Jesus? You know, our, our, everything we believe hinges on two things, the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. Everything we believe on those two things. And you've got to be able to help people understand these two things. So as I'm walking you through it, if you need to snap pictures, whatever you need to do, I want you to understand this. Newsweek magazine conducted a poll asking some questions about Christ and his birth. Here's some of the results. 67% believe that the entire story of Christ's birth is historically accurate. That's pretty good. We're talking about Americans here. 67%. If Jesus had never been born, people believe that there would be 63% less charity. That's love. 61% less kindness, 59% less personal happiness, 58% less tolerance, and 47% more war. Hmm. So his birth changed everything. It changed the way we, this is 2022. How we know that? Because of the birth of Jesus. Amen. We, we walk through it all. So can you validate his birth, that message? 1 Peter 3.15, Peter said, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't be mean about it. But if somebody says, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because Jesus came to earth, died for me. He's my substitution for my sin. I fall on his grace because I'm no good on my own. Amen. That's how I know. You've got to give an answer for the hope. Because some people watch you go through things in life and they look at you and go, how you act that way? You had the loss of a spouse, a friend, a, a family member. You lost a job. You've, this has happened to you. It looks like life cratered. And you still got this hope. You got this funky smile about you that you believe that everything's still going to be all right. Amen. And when they see that in you, you've got to give them an answer for that hope. The Bible says the Lord himself has given us a sign. See, I believe in the virgin birth. All of Christianity hinges on those things. The virgin birth, the birth of Christ, the resurrection, and all of the Old Testament anticipated his arrival. When you read the books out of the Old Testament, it's about him coming. Jesus is coming. There's some fixing to happen. The validity of even the smallest part of the Bible teeters on the miracle of the virgin birth. You say, well, does it really matter? The virgin birth matters. Amen. It ma Listen, without it, Joseph is a pedophile because that young lady was probably 13, 14, 15 year old, and he's probably in his 40s. 
Without the virgin birth, Mary was a promiscuous harlot. All of Christ's followers, including you and I, we imbeciles and the thousands of men and women who have given their lives as martyrs were absolute fools. The virgin birth matters. There's a rising tide of, of illiteracy, particularly among, again, I use this word lightly, Christians, who, who don't understand and you, you talk to them and, and you think, hold on, you've been in church your whole life and, and that's the best you got? Amen. That's all you believe? Amen. Barna, and I, I look at Barna a lot. Barna's a, a man that gives a lot of polls about the church. And he said, among born-again Christians, that it contains this disturbing news. The validity of the message of the gospel is everything. It's how we live and die. He said 26% of believers... Christians believe all religions are basically equal. How do you say a quarter of all religions are basically equal? They, they ain't nothing equal to what we got. There's nothing. I mean, our gospel is profound. Our gospel is concrete. 50% believe that good works will get you to heaven. I had my whole life was meeting people that believed that good works would get them to heaven. And somehow they joined good boy and good girl clubs, hoping that what they did here. Now, I'm going to say it. What we do here matters there, but it's normally after the grace of God has touched your life. Because you can be good the rest of your life. You can, you can give to your alumni. Amen. You can give to all the little clubs. You, you can promote your little uh, aprons. You can do all this other stuff and tell everybody just how wonderful you are and die and go straight to hell and none of that stuff matter. None of it matters. But if you got grace on your life and, and Jesus loves you and you know you love him, and now what you do is going to matter there. Everything shifts on that moment. So don't, don't, don't be thinking, well, my good works matters. Amen. By the way, it doesn't mean for you to be bad. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, uh, 35% do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. How do you expect that you're going to rise from the dead if you don't believe he rose from the dead? 45% do not believe that Satan exists. Well, if you don't believe there's a devil, then evidently you are really the problem. Because I got to have something to blame some of this stuff on. Can I get an amen? There got to be a devil out there somewhere running around. He on a long chain or something. I believe in it. 33% uh, accept same-sex marriage. You know, this, this is where we're at today. It, it falls into that. And, and, and you struggle with it. You fight with it. But the bottom, we love people. Man, I, just, I just love people. And I got to let them walk through this and figure this thing out for themselves in a lot of ways. But on the other side, I don't have to fall for everything that I'm seeing in the world today. Amen. I, I can still love and teach my kids the right way. So this is strong evidence of how American Christianity is conforming to a secular uh, culture. No wonder there's so much confusion. It is all right to be religious according to the dictates of today's liberals as long as your faith exists in your head. But if you decide to walk this thing out, believe this thing, lift your hands in church and worship, amen, give God a, a, a hallelujah and a Walmart for a good deal, thank you, Jesus, amen, they want to shut you down. Oh, I can't do that. I got to live this thing out loud. Can I get an amen? Amen, you got to. If you start claiming that your beliefs are more than just a private mental state that makes you feel good, asserting instead that what you believe is objectively real and valid for everybody, uh, here's the thing. To believe otherwise makes you an intolerant menace to society. One reason that we get hated is because people look at us with our beliefs that are so strong. And, and, and again, it's not spitting icicles. It's not being mean toward people. It is love. It is compassion. It, at times, it's being a little bit tolerant. But the bottom line is, well, you're a menace to society if you love Jesus. They are bothered by you. Amen. Because you have something solid. Amen. You have something valid. You got a message worth standing on, and it convicts their way of living. And if it does that, amen, next thing you know, you become their enemy. And this is what's happening, and we're seeing it. And what's sad, even so much stronger than political realms. So this is why churches like the, uh, the Methodist church right now is at a crossroad. Have y'all been reading any of this? Methodist churches are pulling away from Methodist churches because the Methodist churches have decided that it's okay for their pastors to dress like drag queens and, and teach the, the kids it's okay to be different in that way. And so you're, they're having drag queens. And this is so stupid. I don't even know why I'm wasting my time behind a pulpit talking about this. But, but this is the Methodist churches of today. And they're pulling away and saying, we ain't that way. We don't like our pastor wearing lipstick. You know, it's one thing. It's one thing to enjoy Mrs. Doubtfire. 
Can I get an amen? It's one thing to have, what's that one, uh, uh, Matilda or Medea. It's one thing to enjoy Medea. But I never look at Medea and Mrs. Doubtfire as, as two men promoting homosexuality. I've never looked at that. I've laughed at that. That's funny. I mean, you put a dress on Joseph over here, I'm going to laugh all day long. <laughs> but there won't be nothing serious about it. Can I get an amen? But if they dress up like a drag queen and to, and, and to read pro, uh, promiscuous books to your kids in, in a Methodist church, the Methodist said, you know what? Enough is enough. And they just begin to split and pull apart. This is going to keep going on until Jesus comes back. Even, as a matter of fact, that's, again, why I smile, because I know he's got to come back because this thing is too screwed up for me to unscrew. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so maybe Jesus does need defending in 2022. Or perhaps we need to remind ourselves of what we really believe. If you think about it, all the elements of our Christian worldwide view are in the Christmas story. Because the coming of Christ changed history, literally, from B.C. to A.D. We're, we aren't straining to say things. Everything is different now that Jesus has come. Everything. Everything in my life is different when I met him. The coming of Christ establishes the truth. Amen. It's astounding when you read about it. An angel visited a virgin who became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her womb was the son of God from heaven. God caused a heathen emperor to call for a taxation that sent Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem. What? At the very moment Jesus was born. Prophets foretold both the virgin birth and his birth in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. A star led the magi, the wise men, from the east directly over the house where Jesus was at three years of age. Angels spoke to shepherds, and angels spoke to Joseph on three separate occasions. An angel spoke to the, to the wise men, warning them not to return to Herod. Even the slaughter of the infant boys, the infanticide of Bethlehem, fulfilled ancient prophecy. When A. Simeon held baby Jesus in his arms, he prophesied of Jesus' death on the cross. He knew it was going to happen. Then there are the names he is given. Wonderful Counselor. Some seem to think what well, his name is Wonderful and Counselor. Well, I don't know if there's a comma there. He's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus, Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, Son of the Most High, Christ the Lord. Then there are the things he will accomplish. The Bible says he will save his people from their sins. Amen. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. His kingdom will never end. So our message has been stamped from heaven, validated, validated validated. Amen. I, I, you, you ever got your ticket validated? Been in an apartment somewhere or, 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 or in a lawyer's office? You validate my ticket so I ain't got to pay to get the way out of here. Amen. That's what God did. He said, you believe this message. You stand on this message. Then there comes that day when I get you out of here, validate your ticket and you come on home. Validate. Amen. Validate. That's what we want. You know, it was, it was Elijah who stood with the prophets of Baal and if you understood anything about the, the Bell Prophets, it's a uh, very promiscuous set of gods that they believed in. And, and at that moment, you know, they, they brought this bull in, and they cut the bull up, and they laid it on the altar, and, and it was called the battle at, at Mount Carmel, and, and they poured the, the barrels of water, which was the sacrifice, because there was no water. It had been a drought for years on top of that. But then this statement that Elijah makes is so true for today, 1 Kings eighteen twenty one, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if it's Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. See, this is where we're at today. When you answered not a word, you answered. I said, when you answered not a word, you answered. And this is where our people stand today. We're afraid to make a stand. I know we're afraid to hurt people's feelings. And we're afraid to, and, and this is the difficult part of life today. But there has to still be a truth to say, you know what, I, I got to work out my own salvation. You got to work out your own salvation. But I can tell you right now, this is what the book says. Hallelujah. I'm going to do the book. I'm going to get to blessing. And so I, I'm not going to halt here. I'm going to believe in God. And then he spoke and the fire came down from heaven and lapped up the water and the bull. Hallelujah. But sometimes you got to cut the bull first. Can I get an amen? Okay, all right. Let's get on to the next part of here. Uh, and I, I won't go as long as I did last week. I, I, I violated my time. And I want to validate my message. The value of humanity. 
See, this is why you have to be careful when you throw everybody under the bus. You know, even the things I said already offended some of you because you're, you're, in a, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Let's just be honest. You're, you're caught there. You struggle. Our children affect us so much, our grandkids and family, so we, we get caught there. Let me just tell you, everybody here has value. God values everybody here. I still believe the Scripture says that God wishes no one to perish. And that's not exactly as that, that he doesn't want people to perish, amen, and go to hell. That's never God's wish. Hell wasn't created for us. It was created for Satan and the imps, amen. But it ended up being for us. So when I read the Scripture about value, to estimate or assign worth to something or someone, when you give people value, you give them hope. You, you give them a meaning and a, and a desire to live and to press on for another day. You, your place in life is not to remove value, but to give value. When I, I look around and I see my family, I give them value. My staff, amen, uh, value. They're, they're valuable. People, your, your friends around you. I celebrated this week because two very close friends of mine were able to sell their homes over the value. And it blessed me. Amen. Go, go ahead and get blessed that way. To estimate or assign worth to something or someone. For God so loved the world that he gave. God said, I want to tell you how much I value this world and the people in it. The most valuable thing in this heaven is not the street of gold. It's not the kingdoms that I've built or all the galaxies that I have strewn out. Amen. It's not all the mineral rights and all the things and thoughts I've had, God said. The most valuable thing I've got here is my son. And I so value the people on this earth that I've created that I will allow my son to die in their substitution. Amen. My friend, that's value. That should be an appreciation, make you want to come to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, even if I ain't here. Amen. You, you just want to serve God, pray in the mornings, give God thanks in the afternoon, and, and, and give a love offering to something that evening. Amen. Just find something to give to. Hallelujah. God has entrusted all of his work into our hands. God has a dream for everyone and has given everyone a gift to influence people and to guide people to him. But without knowing Christ, we can use our gifts in the wrong way and destroy people. He's given everybody here a gift. Use it right. Value equals destiny. Amen. So I'm going to close with Psalm 139. I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 139, verse 5. I love revelatory, which is a big word for revelation. When people get a revelation about who we are or why God did what he did. When I'm reading Psalm 107, to me, it's a revelation. When King David looked around, he said, you know what? I saw people in poverty, and they cried out to God, and he heard them. He said, I looked around, I saw people in plague, and they cried out to God, and he heard them. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works toward men. I saw people in prison. They cried out. God heard them. And I, I often feel like it was David saying, I was in poverty once. I didn't have anything, and I cried. I was in plague, I had issues, and I cried out, and God heard me. I was in prison, I was in, a, I was in a cave running from Goliath, and I cried out, and God heard me. I've been a king now for a while, looks like things were going well, and then my children started doing wrong things, and I realized as a pilgrim, my life has been going up and down, I cried to God, and he heard me. That's revelatory. David later wrote, and I, I don't know how much this may mean to you, but I believe that David was illegitimate, that his dad, mom of the, all the boys, the seven boys, amen, he, that was not his mama. His mama was from somewhere else. Because of that, we see David being kind of pushed aside out in the fields, kind of forgot about when, when Samuel came in to anoint a king, and they had to call David in from the fields and Realized this little freckle-faced boy was that. And David had revelation like no one else when he stood and he said, let me, let me tell you the value of humanity. 
He said, you've beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Look at that verse again. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days. You, you, you looked at me and said, it's unformed, but that's me. I, I don't even have a shape of a head, shoulders, and legs, but you said, that's me. You knew that was me. That's why I've always said God thought you before he brought you. He thought you before he brought you. Amen. He knew your unformed body. He said, you, you saw, and then you ordained. You, you set things out for me before were written in your book before one of them came to be. Before, <laughs> Cheryl, you think you could write all the things you've written about me before I say it? No. And yet God said, before you showed up, I already wrote it down. I knew what was going to happen in your life. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, you're still with me. I conclude with a thought again. There's so many problems, just one answer. Amen. So many problems, just one answer. Hallelujah. My friend, we have a message to validate. When people see you, they validate that Christ is alive, that God loves me, amen, and that I'm, I matter. I have value. Would you allow me to pray for you this morning? Father, I thank you for this house and your people. I thank you for seasoning my words with grace. God, let us come into a place of understanding that this book is really uh, how I have to lead my life and guide my life and work through my life. There may be things I don't agree with it, but God, I need to agree with you. I thank you that you love us like this, that you validate us, that you wrap your, yourself around us, and, and you showed us how much you, you sent your son. No greater message than sending Jesus to substitute for us. Satan has deceived. He's divided. He's conjured up spells against your people. He's caused confusion in the house, not of just the house of God, but in our own homes. God, help us to understand and unravel this mess. I thank you for your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. amen. Come on, give God praise.